Thank you, Marta, and uh, thank you to the Simons Foundation, as always, for having me. Um, so uh, I'm very excited to talk with you tonight about um, a couple things, both the Autism Inpatient Collection and some of the things we've been learning and the resource that that, that is for the investigative community. And also want to talk about um, a pilot study and work that we've been doing within that autism inpatient collection um, around arousal, emotion regulation, and challenging behaviors. There we go. Um, so uh, just disclosures. So I work for a, a large nonprofit behavioral health organization, Maine Behavioral Healthcare, where we do treatment. Uh, and then we also do research in those settings. I have funding from the foundation as well as NIH and the Nancy Larry Marks Family Foundation. Uh, and I also advise a summer camp for kids with uh, autism called Camp Allsing, which is in Maine. Um, so our agenda today, as I said, is I want to talk about challenging behaviors uh, individually, then talk about physiologic arousal, um, then talk about emotion dysregulation, um, all in people with autism, um, and then uh, tell you a little bit about the autism inpatient collection and some of the things we've learned, um, some of our phenotypic results to date. Uh, and then, as I said, talk about uh, some work we've been doing uh, connecting challenging behaviors, physiological arousal, and emotion regulation. Um, and uh, I definitely wanted to recognize uh, that I have two strong uh, collaborators in this work. Um, Carla Mazevsky, who's a co-investigator out of University of Pittsburgh, and she's a co-investigator on the Autism Inpatient Collection, and also Matthew Goodwin at Northeastern University, who is a collaborator on this work as well. Um, so as I said, we uh, have been working on looking to link um, the concepts of physiologic arousal and um, challenging behaviors and emotion regulation. And so our basic conceptual framework is that an individual is at autonomic equilibrium on the far left. They experience distress of, of whatever nature, um, could be auditory, could be whatever the distress is, a distress signal that induces a, physio a change in physiologic arousal, potentially. And then depending on their regulatory abilities, um, if they can either, uh, if they have, uh, are able to self-regulate, then they would not engage in a challenging behavior, in this example, aggression, versus uh, not able to regulate, then they might engage in a challenging behavior. So in other words, part of the hypothesis here is the function of the challenging behavior is a regulatory uh, construct. It can, of course, serve other functions, but that is uh, part of the hypothesis here. And with the um, end result being a return to autonomic equilibrium. So that's the basic framework that, that we're working within. So let's talk about each of those pieces a little bit. So challenging behaviors um, are a big problem. Um, the reason I, I make that obvious, perhaps obvious statement is because a lot of uh, people who you might interact with or see in the movies, et cetera, on the autism spectrum, this is not what's presented. Um, however, in the settings I work in and the families I work with, this is why people are coming to see us in behavioral health care or in primary care. These are the, the, the challenges or some of the challenges people are dealing with. And actually, up to two-thirds of youth with autism develop aggression at some Just point. Two I'm sorry? Up to two thirds, because there's a range of studies showing, you know, forty percent, fifty percent. So depending on the sample, yeah, yeah. Just summarizing, uh, yeah, yes, yes. Um, so uh, and showing it at different points. You know, some develop kind of chronic aggression pictures. Others, it's uh, just a phase. Um, and we know very little, actually, actually to. Uh, you know, uh, Jim's point, we know very little actually about the natural history of the development and cessation of aggression in autism. Uh, so that's a longitudinal study waiting to be done. Um, so anyway, uh, so we do know from health services research that what, what I said to you is in fact true. Aggression and other externalizing behaviors are a primary reason that youth with autism utilize healthcare services and therefore incur costs. Um, 
Also, we hear from families that aggression really increases their stress, isolation, financial burden, and decreases their available options. And I'm gonna say a little more about that because I think it's the most important piece in many ways. Um, so what is a challenging behavior? Um, so the kind of clinical approach to a challenging behavior is, is it significant, worthy of, challenge, uh, worthy of clinical attention? And the question there is, is well, you know, it's the question, when is a problem a problem? Well, in this context, I think a problem is for a child, certainly, when it interferes with learning, uh, if it's socially isolating, um, if it interferes with community activities, certainly if it's an imminent safety risk causing injury to self or others um, or damage to the environment, um, also can heavily impact family functioning, and if it's failing to respond to typical or you know, traditional parenting techniques, then that, that is also a problem. Um, in terms of the behaviors that lead to children being hospitalized, going into psychiatric hospitals, um, they are the uh, more severe forms of these behaviors. So um, this was a study we did where we just said, well, what's the, what's the chief complaint, the kind of primary reason this child's been hospitalized? And this was the breakout. So aggression, SIB, which is self-injurious behavior, property destruction, and then a smattering of other things. Um, so, and of course, many children have multiple of these, but this was what is the, the chief complaint or biggest problem. Um, so this is particularly a problem and maybe particularly or less tractable so far in the minimally verbal population. So people with autism who um, are either nonverbal or minimally verbal in that they don't have full, fra full fluent speech. Um, and that is still, by most estimates, 30 to 40 percent of the autism population still is, is minimally verbal. Um, and so the, what's important about this and where I think it is perhaps most challenging with this population is that it generates unpredictability or it's part of what generates unpredictability. So since the individual can't or may have difficulty reporting that they are distressed, uh, and our world is primarily a verbal auditory world, that's how we communicate primarily uh, interpersonally, then if they can't report it efficiently and spontaneously, um, then it gives the impression to people in the environment that then the behavior that follows, what the distress that leads to the behavior comes out of the blue, you know? And I think it's our theory that very little in this world happens out of the blue in this, in this context. We just, we think it's out of the blue because we don't know, we can't read the signs, we don't know what's happening. Um, so the problem with out of the blue or unpredictability, unpredictability is that is what causes people to be excluded from things. It's not the actual, if you knew the behavior was going to happen or you knew it was going to happen at some rate, you could plan for it, you could manage for it, you could staff for it, you could try to treat it, all of those things. But if you don't know it's going to happen or you don't know when, so it's unpredictable, then you're afraid to go to the grocery store. You're, the child gets kicked out of the educational setting, and this is true for adults as well. Um, and so, and that's what leads to the high utilization of psychotropic medications, hospitalizations, out-of-home placements. Um, and so, I think the unpredictability is sort of the the key piece to this. Um, and so, here's a couple quotes from parents: uh, "We are like prisoners held hostage to his aggression. We can't go to the grocery store or to a restaurant. Um, we hear that not infrequently." And then. Uh, as I borrowed this person's word, it's the unpredictability that's the worst. We don't know when it will happen or why, so you always have to be on guard and prepared for the worst. So therapeutic, uh, messed this up. So therapeutic approaches to challenging behaviors. So how do you treat challenging behaviors? Stepping back. Um, so certainly the thing that we probably have the best evidence for is applied behavioral analysis. Um, however, and we don't have time to go into you know, all of that, but however, we have good evidence for the use of applied behavioral analysis for challenging behaviors. However, still, even in ABA studies, 30% of assessments result in being inconclusive about what the function of the behavior is, which is the point of, of applied behavioral analysis. Um, psychotropic medication, I probably don't need to say, we have inconsistent success 
Uh, we often don't know why. Um, studies are, are sometimes mixed, and there's certainly significant side effects. Um, there are other strategies below that vary in their evidence base behind them, but also the primary issue with the strategies below and with ABA is access um, is a major challenge. So now let's start to relate arousal to challenging behavior or talk about arousal. So in typically developing youth, so this has been studied fairly well, and in typical developing youth, um, it's clear that greater ability to modulate physical, physiologic arousal is associated with fewer behavioral problems. This has also been looked at in, in ASD in a number of studies, um, and I think there's some evidence that this is true also in ASD, that there's an association between physiological arousal and problem behavior in ASD. Um, and so that brings to the hypothesis that was proposed in these papers, um, and also we are uh, interested in pursuing, which is that the problem behavior is engaged in as an attempt to alleviate distress and maintain physiologic homeostasis, or return to it. And I guess I'll just say that's not how behavior in autism is typically looked at. It's typically looked at serving a function, the function being to escape, to obtain a preferred object or activity, or to attain social attention. And that I'm not saying that those things are not true. They, they are true, but there may also be another function, another way to look at behavior in autism. Um, I'm going to skip this and just say, so in terms of arousal, you may recall from, from past classes that um, this is a busy slide, but it's showing the autonomic nervous system, the sympathetic division, and the parasympathetic. Sympathetic um, on your left being the fight or flight response, um, and basically is your alerting response, and the parasympathetic on the right is called the rest and digest. It's your sort of calming response, and these two are always operating, and you can think of them as being an attention uh, against each other, whether you have more sympathetic drive, less sympathetic drive, and the same for parasympathetic, and they're in a relationship. Um, and so one of the ways, so there are many ways to measure this. Um, one of the ways to measure this is the sympathetic nervous system innervates sweat glands on the skin, and we are all sweating a little bit all the time. We think of ourselves as sweating when it's pouring off us, but we're all sweating a little bit at a time, and the amount you're sweating at a micro level varies depending on your arousal level, depending on your sympathetic nervous system drive. And so you can get at arousal by trying to detect the amount you're sweating on the skin, and the amount you're sweating on the skin drives or, or relates to the electrical conductance across your skin. And so this uh, busy slide is showing what is essentially like a $1,000 Fitbit. It's, um, it's called the Empatica E4, soon to be E5 device. And um, it has a number of things that it detects, uh, which are listed on the right, uh, including um, heart rate variability, um, three axis accelerometry, which is movement in three axes, temperature, um, and most importantly for what we're talking about, skin conductance, um, electrodermal activity. And so electrodermal activity is a measure of your arousal level by the mechanism that I described to you. So this um, is uh, from my colleague, Dr. Goodwin, a basic uh, look at this. It's not looking at skin conductance. It's not looking at electrodermal activity, EDA. It's looking at heart rate. Um, which is a much more gross, I think, measure of arousal and, and an imperfect one <coughs> at that. Um, however, it, it's, a, it's a good way to illustrate this. So here's a person over time, so it's beats per minute on the y-axis, and over time, uh, the person is at baseline. Then you see in the second block, um, there is an arousal increase represented by the heart rate going up, as well as the heart rate variability going up. And then the person engages in a challenging behavior. Maybe they have a tantrum, hit someone, break something, something like that. And you see the heart rate goes way up. Then there's an arousal decrease as represented by heart rate and the variability and then back to baseline. And then in a different example, there's an arousal decrease preceding a challenging behavior. So it's not necessarily that it's always going up. It's that there's a deflection, you know, positive or negative. 
this was from a real person. Yeah. Yeah, this was in Dr. Goodwin's lab at, at Northeastern. So that's arousal. So we talked about challenging behavior, arousal. Now let's talk about emotion regulation. So emotion regulation is actually an emerging concept, or hopefully it's emerged at this point in autism. It's, it emerged a little earlier in the rest of kind of child psychology and mental health, but has come to autism only fairly recently. Um, and um, this is mostly the work of my colleague, Carla Mazewski, and others that she works with that she's involved me in, um, where they've really been looking at emotion regulation as being um, a core challenge or impairment um, in individuals with autism. Um, and this is one way that they've constructed it, is that many of the features that we see in autism, such as alexithymia, limited emotional language, some of the cognitive rigidity, poor flexibility in, in changing, shifting sets, um, lower inhibitory control, and I won't read the whole thing to you, but all these different factors contribute or can contribute to what they have conceptualized as um, a challenge with emotion dysregulation or a challenge in regulating one's emotions. And so they see this as kind of a transdiagnostic core impairment in many individuals with autism. You can also have difficulties with emotion regulation in other phenotypes besides autism, obviously. Um, and so one way they've pursued this is that this is a better explanation um, for what for the kind of widespread of psychiatric diagnoses that are often applied to people with autism. And you know, they say they have autism and anxiety or autism and ADHD or autism and depression, but maybe really what you're calling all those comorbid things, the depression, anxiety, et cetera, it are just features of difficulties with emotion regulation. And I'm not saying that's so, but they've raised that question, which I think is a good one. And so increasingly, we're starting to see studies of emotion regulation in autism. So we did a paper in 2013 that was trying to kind of spread this concept uh, in JCAP. And um, at that time, uh, did a lit search, and there were only 15 articles on the bottom right that mentioned autism and emotion regulation. Recently redid that search, and there were 117. So there's definitely a move toward this concept uh, in the literature. So why should we care about emotion regulation? Well, we know that more impaired emotion regulation is associated with more anxiety and depressive symptoms. It's associated with more challenging behavior. It's associated with worse social functioning, classroom problems, college transition problems. Um, and uh, with data from the AIC, we're actually able to show that it's, um, it's a risk factor for, ho for psychiatric hospitalization. So ER is maybe something we should, we should care about or pay attention to. However, we still don't know a lot about emotion regulation in autism. Um, and that's because the literature has mostly been self-report from high-functioning samples. Um, usually it's caregiver reports, actually, not self-report. Um, and it relies on verbal, it's, they're verbally dependent measures. So in other words, you can't study someone who's not uh, fluently verbal. Um, and most of the measures that are used of emotion regulation have been borrowed from typically developing, that were developed uh, with typically developing samples and now are being applied in autism, which is not necessarily, that's how much of study of autism has gone in terms of measures, is you take the measure that's available that seems the best and you apply it to the population, but then often we realize that measure isn't performing very well in this population, so we need to develop our own measure that's autism specific. So that's what our group, led by Dr. Mazewski, has done through partially through using the um, autism inpatient collection, is actually developed a new measure of, or the first measure of emotion dysregulation in autism um, that's specific to the population. So in developing a new measure, um, this was the conceptual model. So what we wanted to do was get at emotion dysregulation um, and this is how emotion dysregulation breaks out in terms of how you could, how, this is how we conceptualized it. So there's affective experience and affective control, and then each of those has subdomains. 
And so when we developed this measure, or really I should say when Dr. Mazowski developed this measure and we assisted, um, these were, this was our conceptual model. And then when we tested all the items, which there were 68 candidate items in, initially, uh, and did all the work to shrink down to what were the factors. It was a two-factor solution. There was a reactivity factor and a dysphoria factor. Um, so I'll show you what these items look like. So there's what it's boiled down to is a reactivity short form. So this is a, a parent or a caregiver measure um, it's not a self-report because we wanted a measure that could apply to the whole, the full spectrum. Um, and so these are some of the items you can see. And they were carefully written to not be verbally dependent. In other words, you don't need verbal output from the individual to answer the question. Um, and so they broke into these two areas, reactivity and dysphoria. So the measure performs very well, um, I think it's fair to say. Uh, and this is, uh, we've done one publication on this, another one hopefully is about to be accepted. Um, so on the left, what this is showing is the black line is the full EDI, which is 24 items, the emotion dysregulation inventory. The short, and then the red is the short form, uh, which is the reactivity short form. Um, and it's showing that both of them capture more information or outperform, if you will, some of the measures that are commonly used that people try to use to measure emotion regulation in this population, being the aberrant behavior checklist, irritability subscale, the ABCI, the CBCL in a couple of its um, subscales. So a very short measure, seven items, uh, is outperforming some of these other measures just in our, in our testing. But I think in some ways the most exciting part of this, and it's quite rare if you think about measures in autism, um, is this measure had no differential item functioning, meaning um, that whether the individual had, uh, regardless of their verbal ability, IQ, age, or gender, but the important part is regardless of their verbal ability or IQ, the measure uh, was valid and performed independent of those those um, variables. So in other words, you can use this measure across the spectrum from nonverbal to fluent verbal, from low IQ to high IQ. That's very rare. There's very few measures that you can do that with. Um, it was also strongly associated with aggression, which is helpful since, that, since that's part of what we're looking at. So um, that was a little deviation into, into uh, a measure that we had to develop to look at emotion regulation. Okay, so now I'm gonna switch a little bit. So I told you about challenging behaviors, arousal, emotion regulation. Now I'll tell you about this um, autism inpatient collection, some of what we've learned about it, and then I'll try to bring it all together, hopefully. Um, so with the support of the foundation and others, um, we formed this uh, uh, collaborative, which we call the Autism and Developmental Disorders Inpatient Research Collaborative. And this, is, this collaborative is performing the AIC, Autism Inpatient Collection Study. Um, these are the institutions involved in it. And why did we do this? Um, well, it relates to what uh, really what Marta said when she was doing her kind intro introduction for me, which is um, we recognize that knowledge and treatment options for this population, this more severely affected population that has <coughs> externalizing behaviors um, and maybe non or less verbal and has intellectual disability, um, were really lagging behind. Uh, and part of the reason is because they don't participate in research very much, or they're not able to participate, or we don't find a way to have them participate. And we recognize that we have these folks in uh, these treatment units, in these inpatient units, uh, where they're receiving treatment. And so the thought was, well, we have the population, and in fact, we have them essentially, you know, right there. And so, you know, what can we learn and, and take advantage of this, this unique situation? Um, and so we also thought because this is an inpatient setting, it's safe, we we're, we're know how to manage challenging behaviors, uh, that this is really an ideal platform. It's, 
uh, and hopefully you understand the, the context I'm saying this in, that, that it's really a living laboratory. This is a perfect place to study this. And how would you study aggression um, uh, in vivo in an outpatient setting? It would be very difficult, right, because of safety risks. But that's what we're doing all day long in this inpatient setting. So um, we thought this was an ideal place to study this and um, that we could study it in vivo. And we also have a lot of control, obviously, over the environment. So a little bit about the Autism Inpatient Collection, AIC. So it's a six-site study. Um, it's of youth with ASD. It's weighted because of who comes into these units um, toward the more severely affected, as I said. Um, however, it does also have the full range. So we have plenty of folks with uh, you know, uh, IQs over 100 and fluent verbal, but it is weighted toward those who have more challenges. <clears throat> At this point, uh, so we've been enrolling, I think, for just over four years. We have a, just over 1,000 probands enrolled with ADOS-confirmed autism. Um, the basic protocol is we collect data at admission primarily, some data at discharge, and then a two-month follow-up phone call. We take biologic samples, primarily blood, but saliva if we can't get blood, from both the individual as well as the biological parents, ideally. Um, just some quick information, 48% of the population is minimally verbal. Um, that's hard to find other samples where, unless you select for that, that it's that high a percentage. 42% uh, with intellectual disability with a very uh, conservative measure of intellectual ability. We do the lighter three, uh, which is a nonverbal IQ test. And so in other words, we're giving them every chance to score uh, that we can, and we'll do it multiple times if they're having behavioral challenges. Um, and so the point of this and the goal ultimately is actually not what we're studying and, and the results we're producing, but really the greater good is to produce an accessible database, um, biosamples, and genetic sequencing similar to the Simplex collection, and so that has begun, and I'll show you a little bit about that, um, for people to use uh, and uh, administered by the foundation. And so we published an initial article about it in 2015, just describing our methods. So the AIC, I'm happy to say, is on Safari Base now, um, right down there. Um, a little dis description of it is here. And uh, what is on Safari Base now is the phenotypic data from the first 527 uh, individuals or probands in the study, and eventually it will be all of them as the data flows in. Um, <coughs> So here's a little bit of a snapshot of the sample or the data that's available. So this was on the first 350 uh, people who came into the study. Average age is almost 13. So I'll just do quick comparisons to the SSC because people are you know, very familiar with the SSC. It's such an important collection. Um, so I believe, although I should be, it's maybe dangerous to do quick comparisons off the top of my head because if I get it wrong, everyone in the room who works with the foundation knows all the data on the SSC, but I believe the average age in the SSC is significantly younger, six or seven years old, I believe. Um, uh, the male to female, whoops, the male to female ratio, here we have a good percentage of females, 21%. Um, and I'm sorry, 42% with intellectual disability in this sample of 350. And the average nonverbal IQ is running at 76. So there are some other facets here you can look at, but those are maybe some of the points to, to identify. So we have produced a series of papers off this data set, the phenotypic data set, <clears throat> and I'll just mention them to you, uh, and, and you can find them. Uh, and uh, hopefully this spring they will all be collected actually as a special issue in the, in the Journal of Autism and Developmental Disorders called Studying the Severely Affected. So um, we're looking forward to that coming out. Uh, but these are all published. So we have a methods paper, we have a risk factors for self-injurious behavior paper. We also did a best practices paper to try to spread the best practices from these treatment units, uh, which was not a data-driven paper. Uh, we have the emotion dysregulation inventory, um, a paper on sleep and problem behavior. There's also a paper in development, which is the blue, on sleep and caregiver stress. 
Uh, we have a behavioral outcome paper, a predictors of psychiatric hospitalization, uh, and several others, one about suicidality, trauma, verbal ability and psychiatric symptoms, um, and we have one in development on anxiety. Let's see, and another one, behavior problems and verbal ability and parent stress. So I'm gonna just highlight a couple findings from those papers. Um, so nice paper by one of the co-investigator at Bradley, Julia Rigi um, and Eric Morrow, risk factors for psychiatric hospitalization. So they were able to compare our inpatient sample with a sample they've been collecting in Rhode Island called the Reichardt sample, which is a very interesting sample, which is not an inpatient. It's a, it's, they're trying to basically collect every person with autism in the state of Rhode Island. And fortunately for them, you, it's only one hour from Bradley Hospital to get to every point in Rhode Island. Um, so that's their project. And so because they have that geographic focus, we were, they were able to compare their inpatients with the rest of their outpatient sample. And so what they found in terms of risk factors for psychiatric hospitalization was a few things that are not particularly surprising. Uh, lower adaptive functioning, greater ASD symptom severity were associated with more risk for hospitalization. However, some other things I think are interesting are the being a single parent uh, was associated with hospitalization, the presence of a mood disorder, and the one that surprised me um, was sleep problems. We all know sleep is hugely important, say the obvious, and particularly for children. This is a youth study, five to 20 years old. However, for it to come through independently that having sleep problems at home is a risk factor for psychiatric hospitalization, that was a surprise uh, to me and I think is important. Um, in terms of medication usage, uh, very high rates of medication, greater than 90% of the individuals were receiving psychotropic <coughs> medication. Uh, we saw a slight decline at two month follow up, so we're hopeful that that means there's, there's, that's one of the effects of hospitalization, but we don't, we don't know that. Um, the most common medications were antipsychotics, stimulants, and sleep aids. And um, something that surprised us was we expected to see differences across age groups or gender or IQ in terms of the usage rates for medication, and there really wasn't much variation. Another aspect we looked at is suicidality. Um, so suicidal ideation, uh, and this um, is, we should take this as very preliminary because it was based on one item. We decided to look at this and looked at the measures we had, and there was only one measure of all the measures we do with one item that um, uh, related to this, and it's an imperfect item. It was an item where it's a parent report, and it's asking uh, if their children talk about death or suicide, and the options were never, sometimes, often, or very often. So to our surprise, 22% reported often or very often, which is a very high number. Um, and so we did a paper on that, and some of the correlates with that were having a mood disorder or an anxiety disorder. Um, so we're thinking about following this up with further work on screening and detecting suicidal thoughts and ideation in, in youth with autism, because that's a, that's a very high number, though it is based on a single item. So, you know, we have to be cautious there. Uh, we also looked at the relationship of problem behavior and verbal ability, and I'll just uh, go to the bottom and just say that um, what we found was interesting. Well, I'll just say that, that we compared the minimally verbal and the fluent verbal groups um, in terms of uh, how they look different in terms of problem behavior. And we found the literature on this is actually very mixed. You might think that those who have lower verbal ability are gonna have greater problem behavior, but the literature is actually quite mixed. And so in our sample, we actually found that the severity of these behavioral problems did not really differ significantly whether uh, when we controlled for age and nonverbal IQ. And so that is actually not what we expected to find because um, we thought the literature is mixed, but we thought it would be more um, those who are more severely affected, uh, uh, I'm sorry, that those who have worsened verbal ability uh, would have more self-injurious behavior, stereotype behavior, irritability. And so what we did find that was significant was um, their adapting and coping strategies. 
So I'll leave that there. And so finally, the last piece, I know I'm giving you a stream of results, but I just wanted to give you a sense of what's coming out of this. Um, the last thing is we looked at their behavioral outcomes, uh, if you will, coming out of these treatment units. So this is admission, discharge, and two-month follow-up. And this measure on the left is the Aberrant Behavior Checklist Irritability Subscale, which measures aggression, self-injury, and tantrum. So it's a great measure for externalizing behaviors. Um, and it was developed for the developmental disabilities population. So you see it in a lot of pharmacologic trials, um, et cetera. So anyway, these are our six sites. Um, basically, all the kids come in. This is very high. So they come in fairly high on the scale with a lot of aggression, self-injury, tantrums. Um, at discharge, we see a nice drop, although not the same across these units, but a pretty nice drop for all of them. Uh, and then at two-month follow-up, we see some regression uh, uh, you know, that varies the slope across these units. Um, so we're still looking at this, um, but we saw some signal that length of stay relates to this. Uh, so if you have too short a length of stay, it appears that then the gain on this is not as strong. Um, and we also, you know, it seems to us that there's a, a kind of a grouping here. There's three units that end up here, and there's three that are up here, and we're still trying to piece together why, you know, what are the factors that drive this? Because this is a difference in performance, if you will. But the takeaway is, is that, you know, the, these are kids who are being hospitalized with pretty severe behaviors, and in these specialty units, uh, they are, I think, having a pretty good treatment effect that's enduring for many of them at two months out. Okay, so now I'm gonna try to tie it together. Um, so during the autism inpatient collection, we have done this pilot study looking at arousal and um, aggression, and, and so we chose aggression of all the challenging behaviors because we thought that's where we'd start because it was the e most easiest to define, most discreet. Self-injurious behavior is more challenging, uh, and tantrums are actually more challenging to define when the tantrum starts and ends. So we started with aggression, which means physical aggression toward other people, not objects. That's property destruction. Um, so that's our conceptual framework. So down here is a measure of EDA. So this child, you can barely see it, is wearing the watch or that device on their left wrist, <clears throat> and it's measuring movement and electrodermal activity, right, which is our measure of arousal, um, <clears throat> skin conductance, uh, and it's measuring heart rate as well. So this is a readout of the EDA. So this is their arousal level. And I wanna show you this video. It's a little distressing, um, or it could be distressing for people, uh, because it's a frustration task that this child is doing, um, where trying to build a tower of blocks, but then the uh, uh, examiner is removing some of the blocks, and so it's a frustration task. And the child engages in some self-injurious behavior. Uh, okay. So he's hitting himself in the head. So that's self-injurious behavior. So it's not moving as I thought it would, but on the bottom, over time, I, this is his EDA, and it's increasing with little spikes, but it's generally just increasing over this period of time. So you get the idea. So um, a couple things. For this, you know, you see lots of different patterns. And so this is, can be person specific, the kind of pattern that they have. Um, for this boy, in this instance, it was a steadily increasing pattern with some spikes. Um, but it, overall, it's just a steadily increasing pattern. So something interesting about it is, is just at, toward the end of the video, there was a point at which he seemed to calm, right? And then he attempted to do it again but his EDA did not drop. Um, and so I would interpret that as saying he's still hyper aroused, right? And so it would be a mistake if you, were in a, if you were working with this child to then challenge him while his EDA is still rising. And that's in fact what's done 
he's frustrated again, and then he you know, gets upset, understandably, again. <clears throat> so uh, the study we did, so that was actually a laboratory type thing, but the study we did was actually naturalistic. So what we did is we actually desensitized the kids to these watches, and then we followed them around through the hospital as they went about their day, um, doing the things they do in the hospital treatment program, and they were wearing the watch, um, and then and the watch transmits wirelessly to a research assistant um, to their iPad, and the research assistant is the ground truth. So they're recording when the child has an aggressive act, and they're recording when it stops and when it ends. And so, so if you can picture this, like we've got these children moving around or sitting at tables and doing things, and then there's somebody standing there recording the data. Um, and because we wanted to do this in a naturalistic type approach, which is not the approach I showed you in the video, but that's how we did it. Um, and so they're recording onset and, on, onset and offset of aggressive episodes. Then what we did is, so we did that for um, quite a few kids, 20 kids, about 80 hours of recording. Um, and uh, in, I think, roughly 30 discrete episodes. <clears throat> and then that data that we receive, we then run through a bunch of machine learning classifiers and um, <clears throat> create person-specific and global classifiers. So I'll show you what that means in a second. So this is the output of that. So this is kind of our, our pilot findings. Um, and we think it's quite exciting. So this is 20 minimally verbal inpatients. And this is busy, so I'll spend a little time on this. On the left, what you have is um, in the orange, you, so as I said, the, these watches record several different data streams. So there's temporal information, which is time since last aggression. There is motion signals, which is the accelerometer. There are physiologic signals, which is the EDA, the electrodermal activity, which is our, our measure of arousal. Um, and those are the three data streams. And so this is the um, performance you get for each of those data streams, and then when you combine two, and when you combine all of them. So it's, a, it's the um, area under the curve as a function of time to aggression and the signals that we're looking at from the past three minutes of data. And what we're doing is then saying, what is the accuracy to predict a aggression in the next 60 seconds? Or in this case, in the, next, in the future time, from 15 to 120 seconds. So if we take 60 seconds, which we think is a reasonably, reasonable clinical time frame, um, if you combine all features, we are getting an AUC of about 0.71, I think, yes, on the global model. So here on the right, we're breaking out in the blue the global model, which is aggregating everybody's data, versus all the individual lines are the person-specific data, which outperform the global, which makes sense. Um, and then the mean of the person-specific is 0.84. So these are, so in other words, it looks like with really a first pass without much refinement, I mean, a lot of work to get here, but without much refinement, we're able to predict the onset of a challenging behavior with 70, 80% accuracy based on the last three minutes of data for 60 seconds in the future. That's, I think, pretty good, especially for a first pass. Um, so we're very excited about that. Um, yeah, so as I said, about 80 hours of collection, 70 naturalistic observation sessions. Um, so, you know, a fairly robust data set. And so the important part is, I think, the AUC for either the global or person-dependent models. So you might say, so what? So you know it's coming in a minute. We've had people say this to us, and so we had to realize that, that um, you know, to us, that was really important. Um, but people say, well, that, is that long enough to do anything? So uh, if you'll let me, I'm going to try to display to you how long a minute is. <clears throat> 
Okay, so that was, oh, sorry. That was actually 30 seconds, so double that. Is that enough time to know something's coming, perhaps do an antecedent intervention, react to it, prepare, increase the safety? Yes, so a minute, I think, is a really long time on a clinical time frame. Um, and uh, so that's the way I wanted to display that to you. Okay, so let me see if I can explain this. So what we're driving toward, so that's the study we've done. Now what we're driving toward is trying to create a closed loop system where here's the child with ASD again wearing the biosensor, the watch. It's not a watch, but that's what I call the watch. Um, we first train, you have to train your classifiers, you have to train your data set on this child. So first we ground truth with the research assistant. So the ground truth again is when this child engages in aggressive act, the research assistant is recording it on the iPad and the iPad is time synced to the watch, of course. So you're recording the onset and offset and that's, your, that's one of your data streams is the aggression. So we're recording uh, the EDA here and accelerometry and time, and then we're recording time and um, whoops, and the onset and offset of aggression. That then is fed into our machine learning classifiers, and then where we want to head is that then instead of producing these AUC curves that we look at, you know, days later, et cetera, we can produce once you train your data set and develop your classifiers, you can then in real time, so you do a training set and then you go ahead and run it again, um, and in real time, it can then run that data, classify whether you know an event is predicted in the future or not, and if it is, then it will display some kind of alert to staff. So picture that you get a, ye a red, yellow, green, right, on what's gonna happen a minute from now. Um, and maybe you get that on a mobile device or something else. So that would be a closed system. Um, and that's where we would like to head. So let me give you a little, uh, and so what I wanted to display here is that you have to have somebody to ground truth to train it, but then you eliminate that person because now you've trained on this individual's data set, and so you can just run it without somebody ground truthing it. So in other words, you don't need anyone present except your child and your staff who are typically present, or your teacher or your parent. So what might this look like? So you could picture, so here's a classroom, six kids, here's the teacher looking at their um, device and they're seeing you know, that Johnny's doing well, he's in the blue, Maggie is a little bit into the red, so maybe like we better look out for Maggie. Uh, Susie is really looking red, um, so we're in trouble. And maybe in this example, we've got three kids who are looking not so good, so we better call for some help. Um, so this is just a graphic to display what this might look like. Of course, this could be on the wall, on a screen, various ways you could do it. So this would be staff-oriented or parent or teacher-oriented. Um, of course, even better, and I think very tantalizing in terms of if you think about treatment studies and developing treatments is, well, what about self-monitoring? What if the child themselves could receive a signal that we could work with them on that when they see this certain signal, then we want them to sit down, take deep breaths, whatever the intervention is. And you can picture different interventions that are pretty typical CBT, de-escalation interventions, and other things. So this is what that might look like. So it's kind of a cartoon illustration. So this is my last slide. So actually, we're, I always run over, and we're actually landing on time, which is good. Um, so future directions. So this is where we are now with this. Um, and this is where we want to go uh, over the future, um, and we'll be seeking support for this. So um, we're, right now we're conceiving of it in four phases. Um, so first we need to basically repeat what we've done, but with a larger sample and validate it. Um, and in doing that, we also want to add in, why did I tell you about all that emotion regulation piece? Because we suspect that if we also measure their emotion regulation, that could help us refine um, this approach because uh, we suspect that there are certain profiles that match up with certain physiology and would help us be more efficient in our classification. 
So that's, um, but that's a hypothesis. We don't know that. So, but we have a nice measure of, of, of emotion regulation that we want to use to do that. We also want to study self-injury and tantrums because they're related. They're challenging behaviors, but they're certainly not the same as physical aggression. Uh, and so they may perform somewhat differently in the system. Um, and then we also want to do some emotion coding during standardized tests to see if that, um, what information that gives us. A second phase um, would be then to work on the rest of the feedback loop. Um, so uh, develop the app to record events, a, a friendlier, um, user-friendly app to record events for um, staff or research assistants, and then the alerting system, so the display, and then test the effects. What happens if you introduce this system? So we think it's going to be helpful. It, it makes sense, but we have to test that. That's a hypothesis, right? So we have to test that um, and see what staff's reaction is, what the child's reaction is, et cetera. Um, then a third phase, and now we're getting far out, would be if it's looking good, we want to work on general, uh, generalization and scaling. So we would then go outpatient. So this would all be inpatient, uh, which is where we did this pilot work. We would then go outpatient, study a larger sample, a more heterogeneous population, maybe not quite as behaviorally challenged as our inpatients. And also, I think importantly, see in terms of scaling, so you know, not everyone's going to be able to use these expensive uh, devices, so how would it correlate with a Fitbit, which is an accessible technology, I think. Um, and then finally, if that's looking good, I think it would also be possible to use this approach in drug trials. Um, so I think one thing you could do, there's a number of ways you could think of applying this, but one would be, can the profile and how perhaps in, in response to a standardized task paradigm, how a child's physiology and the relationship with their behavior uh, performs on a standardized test paradigm might help you determine which medication you would want to test with that child or which arm of a study of one medication they might go into. So in other words, if this is a kid, let's just suppose high reactivity, high, or, uh, shouldn't say high arousal, high variability in their arousal, you might think, well, you know, is that child a better candidate for a medication that we know directly regulates um, the autonomic nervous system like um, guanfacine, which is an alpha-2 agonist and reduces sympathetic uh, drive. So, you know, and that's, that's a big unsupported hypothesis I just threw out there, but that's just one way you might approach this. So I think this system has a lot of immediate clinical applicability if it works out, um, and, uh, but also has application in research of other interventions. So in summary, um, kids with autism can develop serious behavioral problems, um, and that puts them at risk. That's a problem in and of itself, but it puts them at risk for a whole bunch of other problems, including polypharmacy, which is the use of multiple medications, hospitalization, residential placement, and really, most importantly, exclusion from the very things they need, education and treatment. If you're kicked out of school, you can't do that wonderful program that you know the people at UCLA developed because you're not in school. Um, in many instances, particularly I think for the minimally verbal, it's the unpredictability that is the problem. So that's why we're focused on prediction and trying to get ahead of events. Um, and so I think our pilot data, definitely pilot, suggests that measuring this combined with other data streams could allow us to predict the onset of aggression in real time. Um, and then the idea of future direction, if we developed a closed loop system um, with real time analysis and alerting, then I think you, know, you could conceive that as trying to shift the paradigm to being a more proactive, predictive work on challenging behavior rather than what we have now, which is fairly reactive kind of treatments and approaches. Um, so that uh, is all. I certainly want to recognize the foundation as well as the Nancy Larry Marks Family Foundation. Um, we have an advisory group, our co-investigators, other people at my institution, and collaborators, and particularly Dr. Mazewski and Dr. Goodwin. And thank you very much. <laughs>